This is Father Bonaventure Chapman. And this is Father Gregory Pine. And welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation or more frequent on Patreon. Be sure to like, subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. Father Gregory, we've got a special episode here, as you can tell. And listeners, if you are merely listeners and not viewers, head to you need to be viewers now for, for a moment because this is a guest explaining episode with Professor Thomas Ward. Professor Ward, thanks for being with us. Really happy to be here. Now, Professor Ward, why I say to switch to video is because he has, like Salvador Dali, a very distinctive facial feature. Uh, his mustache or mustachio is spectacular and, praise, and brings the glory to God, as far as I can tell. Um, so switch. Do not do, if you're driving the car right now, do not. Do not switch to video for this. But when you get home, um, check it out. But uh, Professor Thomas Ward is with us to talk about his new book on SCOTUS, which we'll get to, but a little before that, I suppose. Um, Professor Thomas Ward is the is professor at the, in the Department of Philosophy at Baylor University in Texas, Waco, that is, um, and has degrees from Oxford. Uh, so you hear a lot of English sort of sounding things and Tolkien and Lewis, I'm sure, in the background. Um, also from University of California in Los Angeles, um, a PhD in philosophy there in 2011. He's produced a number of of books. One's John Sc John Dunn Scotus on Parts and Holes and Hylomorphism, which is a be a good read for Lent, um, but very excellent. Uh, a short book, Divine Ideas, which is fantastic. It tells you exactly what divine ideas are. And then uh, the book we're talking about today, which is uh, Ordered by Love. I'm going to hold it up. This might be the best uh, paperback in the Catholic world published, except for maybe this year. These two are vying. Prudence here with Father Gregory and Ordered by Love. So, Dr. Ward, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, again, it's, it's really good to be here. And um... I expect to laugh a lot over the next half hour. <laughs> Good. That's the goal. That's the goal. So, um, so first off, uh, this this book on SCOTUS is is spectacular. Um, and if you're tuning in, God's pointers might think, well, why in the world are we having a SCOTUS guy on? Because we're Dominicans, and Dominicans like Thomas, and Thomas Tom, and Thomas doesn't like or wouldn't like SCOTUS. So maybe by the end of this episode, um, the ideal listener will say, you know. Maybe that's Scotus guy. Not so bad. That's the kind of bigger project, but Father Gregory will deny that. We'll see. Um, but I want to talk about this book because you've done, I think, what is seems almost impossible to do is you've made Scotus the subtle doctor. He's known for his very intricate positions on things, extremely, extremely detailed. You've made him not only intelligible, but I would say like deeply likable and attractive. And I'm not talking about just like his positions on things, but you get a sense that he is a lover. I was thinking about this. You, you, you compare this book, or at least it, it is compared this book to Aquinas' Dumb Ox. Sorry, Chesterton's uh, book on Aquinas called The Dumb Ox, um, which is just an incredible book, incredible book. And you thought, you say this, this book ought to be, or would be called if, if Chesterton was writing this book, uh, The Tonsured Eagle. And I like that because um, Chesterton calls Aquinas the dumb ox in that he is Thomas of the creator. He has this one image, like the Thomas is of the creator. And I was thinking, if you were to give Blessed John, John Duns Scotus a title, it would be something like of the lo divine lover, right? So what is it about it? It's the title, book titled Ordered by Love. Do you think it's fair to say that Scotus is really the, uh, a theologian of the divine lover? And, and how so? What, what, is, what is it about love and Scotus um, that's important? That's a really big, deep question. Um, and I, <laughs> think you want. Right, I think you're right that, it, that love is a central kind of unifying concept across a lot of aspects of Scotus's thought. Um, that probably the, the way in which Scotus is most commonly thought of in connection with love is the controversial position that he and other Franciscans took on this medieval dispute that I know you both know a lot about, which is in the beatific vision, is that uh, union with God primarily an act of the intellect or an act of the will? And of course, both uh, parties to the dispute agree that, it's, um, that it is both um, uh, an act of the will and an act of the intellect. So the question is, which, is, which has the primacy? And um, and Scotus argued uh, powerfully that it is uh, love, and Aquinas argued powerfully that it's intellect. So that's that's probably the context in which most people would come to think of Scotus as having a special emphasis on 
love, but I, I think you're right to emphasize divine love. And that's, um, that comes out in Scotus's uh, theology and, um, and metaphysics even in a few different ways. But um, probably most importantly for Scotus, it is the, the way in which he understands God's free freedom in relation to creation. There's, uh, there's nothing about the, the created order that compels God to do anything. There's nothing about the divine nature that compels God to be a creator at all. So Scotus locates the reason for creation itself, so to speak, in God as lover. He just loves uh, the idea of the world that he goes on to make and preeminently loves one person in particular or one nature in particular, and that is the, the human nature of Christ. And so out of love uh, for that individualized nature, desires, so to speak, to be unified with it hypostatically and to have a whole world and a whole world story in which that uh, that union of divine and human natures in Christ can be sort of the, the main event. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, okay. I'm going to do a zoom out and a zoom in zoom out. I'm thinking of people who listen to God's planning. Um, some of whom I know a couple of whom are my sisters. Um, they might not know who blessed John Dunn Scotus is. So first thing would be, could you just say a word of introduction? Mm -hmm. Um, who is he? I mean, He's a Franciscan. We've heard that much. When did he live? Uh, maybe what were his major contributions? Great. He was born in 1265, um, so nine years before uh, Aquinas died, and he died in 1308. Uh, he was, as, as his name suggests, he was born in Scotland as a young teenager. Uh, he had already joined the Franciscans. They recognized his intelligence, sent him down to Oxford. Um, south to Oxford. I, I, Oxonians say up to Oxford, no matter where you are in proximity to it's Oxford. It's always up to Oxford. It's, it's always, always up, up to Oxford. So they, they sent him up to Oxford, um, which was down south. And then uh, after a while, he got sent over to Paris, um, which was an even better university at the time. And he managed to achieve the highest uh, teaching job available to Franciscans at the University of Paris. Uh, despite having his Parisian career interrupted um, by exile when he supported um, the Pope against the King of France in a dispute those two were having, um, was sent away, but did come back, had his teaching gig. And then for reasons mysterious to historians, uh, his order sent him away uh, from Paris to Cologne in Germany to presumably to teach at the House of Studies there. Um, a relative backwater, culturally and intellectually speaking, compared to Paris. Um, unfortunately, he died within about a year of getting to Cologne, and he's buried there. So relatively short, young life. He died in his early 40s. Um, was, as you say, a, Fran a Franciscan, but primarily an academic, you know, not like a lot of the Franciscans of the 13th century who were you know, missionaries or uh, trying to serve the poor. He was on, on, the, on the academic side. So as far as his contribution goes, uh, they, they're all theological and philosophical. The contribution that the church most values him for is his teaching on the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, theologians in the late 13th, early 14th century had more or less converged um, around the traditional view that um, if Mary wasn't conceived immaculately, she was cleansed of, of original sin at the latest, like the moment after her conception. So, so there was already quite a bit of convergence, but Scotus ran some arguments to push just a little bit further. So prior to her conception, uh, she was all preserved from original sin. And, um, as you know, eventually that, that became dogma, even though it was long before it was uh, officially dogmatized, it was a deeply entrenched position. But Scotus has that sort of uh, claim to fame uh, for, for pushing theological consensus in, in the right direction. Nice. Okay. I'm going to be in Cologne in like a month and a half. 
The last oh, time that I was visit. there, I visited the body of St. Albert the Great, but I didn't know that Blessed John Duns Scotus was there, so now I have another pilgrimage to make. Um, yeah, the so, right church. Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. Um, my, my, then my follow-up uh, to Father Bonaventure's question about love is I'm interested in how love is a form of knowing, or I'm, I'm interested in how knowing and loving converge because I self-identify as a hack Thomist. I don't have original thoughts. I just think things that St. Thomas said, slash thought, but worse. Um, but he has some convergent points, one of which I'm thinking of is the gift of wisdom. So he talks about how the virtues are perfected by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the virtue of charity, which we associate with the will, you know, or those who think what St. Thomas do, uh, is perfected by wisdom, which we would typically associate with the mind. But he describes it as a kind of sympathy for divine things or a suffering of divine things. So this idea that at a certain point, uh, knowing and loving kind of come together. And then especially with things, you know, greater than our minds, it's better to love them than it is to know them insofar as that ecstatic movement of love binds you up with the thing beloved, which is it's better to be with the beloved thing, which is greater than you than to assimilate it and have it. Yeah. Kind of assume the contours of your mind. So maybe in a, in an ironic spirit, could you just talk a little bit about Scotus's wisdom and where places that you see he has kind of knowing and loving come together and mutually enriching? This is a long pause. I'm sorry about that. That's that's also a deep question. It's like it's almost like I'm having a conversation with Dominicans. Um, <laughs> sorry. We apologize for being next ourselves. Time. Yeah. How do you like cats? Yeah. <laughs> what about cat videos? Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me show you some pictures of my kids. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Look at that one. Oh my god. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't quite know what to say here. Maybe, maybe you can, maybe you can help me a little bit. Uh, well, maybe the, yeah, the, I guess the concern, yeah, maybe this is um, for Dominicans have this little trope. We always say, well, you can't, you know, can't love if you don't know it. Um, and wisdom is the divine ordering of, of, of all things. Um, and so that they, the loving, as you say, is kind of secondary. Where the, I guess Dominicans are concerned that if loving becomes like the primary one, perhaps, and and it's not guided by wisdom in the sense of the intellect in some fashion or other, then it it could become unmoored perhaps, or it doesn't seem to have that teleolog the right direction towards an end perhaps. Um, so what in what sense is is Scotus's wisdom? You say it's you said the book is not ordered by love, and I think that's right. Um, but order seems to incline to being a a sort of intellectual kind of structure, whereas loving seems to be more kind of a an emotional passion kind of. Uh, movement, you could say. Um, so how how do these relate? Even though so the, you said the primary uh, in Scotus is love um, it, over over will in a, will over intellect in a sense, but how are they coordinated, or how is it ordered by love, as opposed to ordered around by love? Or if it is ordered around by love, how is that not arbitrary or something like that? Maybe that's is that what maybe that's a good question. If might not be Father Gregory's question, but it might be an okay question. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this, that, that that helps. Uh, Thanks. How methodical uh, is this love, I guess? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there, there is um, there are some debates among readers of Scotus about how, let's say, how radical to interpret his doctrine of the will's freedom. Mm -hmm. um, some do seem to think that, that Scotus, maybe by the end of his career, had this view that I don't really find in Scotus, according to which um, the will is pretty much completely unconditioned by intellect such that it can just sort of, you know, will just radical willing it doesn't need an act of the intellect at all. And that doesn't make much sense to me. Certainly hope it's not Scotus's view. I don't think it is. <laughs> um, so, so um, a more moderate, I think more reasonable view would be to say that, um, you know, there, there cannot be uh, an act of will uh, without an act of intellect, because the intellect supplies the will, so to speak, with its options. Now, one um, uh, difference between uh, Aquinas and Scotus on this point is that for Scotus, the, the, the will, the nature of the will is, is to retain that freedom, even in the event that the intellect is able to present uh, the it's it's object in a completely clear way you know let's say we get we get this um 
perfect understanding of God, um, unqualifiedly good. There's no, there's no way that any other option could be more choice worthy. Uh, does the will retain its freedom? Aquinas says, no. I mean, yes, in the sense that it's, you know, that's, it's like it's reached its goal and, but it, it, it cannot, it cannot refuse. Maybe we could put it that way, which mm -hmm. maybe is the same thing as no longer retaining its freedom. Scotus does think that if, if it could refuse in that circumstance, it would lose its freedom. Um, and so supposes that even then the will has some sort of power uh, not to love the object presented to it by the intellect. It, it can refuse, so to speak, even in that idealized intellectual circumstance. Now, it's a condition on, on beatitude that we uh, never fall away and never have the sort of sort of the fear or the anxiety of ever falling away. And so Scotus recognizing that has, has God give us a special grace of firmness mm -hmm. of will so that in mm -hmm. fact, we won't fall away. But there's nothing in the will as such that is, so to speak, uh, bound to will even the infinite good. Um, and that's, you know, I'm not sure what I think about that. Uh, this, <laughs> this is related to uh, his, you know, maybe almost equally controversial view that the will has two fundamental orientations or affections, not just to uh, happiness, which you might think is the sort of view that Aquinas is committed to, um, but also so an affection toward one's happiness, Scotus thinks, but also an affection toward what is good in itself. Mm -hmm. And the moral life for Scotus really revolves in one sense around uh, evaluating courses of action in the light of one's both one's affection for one's own advantage and the affection for justice or the affection for what is good in itself. Ideally, Scotus thinks we would come to love God perfectly for God's own sake, because he mm -hmm. is the highest good and not for the sake of the fact that in so loving him, we are, we ourselves as agents are completed or fulfilled or anything like that. Yeah. And I know that Aquinas too thinks that that's, that's ultimately what happens. We, we do love God for his own sake and in doing mm -hmm. so are blessed. Um, uh, but there's a, there's a special emphasis there in, in Scotus that I think uh, goes beyond Aquinas. Yeah, that's certainly, and um, and I want to take that for a second and drop back, um, and then we're going to get back to love in a second here, um, because you've got to get back to love. I mean, it's, right, it's the most important thing, right, Father Gregory? Okay. Um, but are uh, Valentine's Day, too. Exactly right, yeah, and if you're listening <laughs> to this podcast now, even though it's live, it, Valentine's Day happened a couple months, weeks ago, so um, go ahead and uh, and buy this book if you forgot about Valentine's Day, and it's now two weeks later. Um, this is a book about lovers for lovers by a lover. Um, so that's great. Anyway, back to this though. So this, as you, you mentioned, these kind of the radical freedom, of course, uh, you have these two, the, the, the will can choose these sort of things. Um, a, the standard story, at least, is that like Scotus is a modern baddie, you know, it's a black hat fellow. Uh, in this, in wearing a Franciscan habit, and like we can just see, there are certain ways you tell the story, whether you're from certain theological circles or philosophical or cultural circles, and all this. Um, but you might think, you know, it takes a lot of truth to float in error. Uh, you know, not, smart people are smart; not everything stupid is stupid. Um, but Scotus does kind of, to me at least, if you step back for a second, he does sit in the straddling between um, the medieval kind of traditional, you could say, whatever that might mean by that. Um, and the modern, like he is, I don't think it's his fault that some things modernity to have, but you can see some of, of the, I would, I would say the degenerations from Scotus is kind of in the Franciscan position. Uh, if you were to, if, you know, if you're coming from a different perspective, you could say, you might see that the natural outworkings of this, it's like, it's not like a, an oak tree is the degeneration of an oak seed. That's just what it becomes. And um, you might think like, welcome modernity where we don't believe in God anymore. That's just what Scotus gives us. Um, I don't think that's true. Let's be hesitant about that. But one issue, particularly, for instance, it, he has so many of these key positions that you could just read as modern nonsense, like radical freedom, you know, independence of indeterminacy. I get to decide ultimately. It's not I'm not guided by the good per se, but I get to choose ultimately at some point. Again, I think it's a bad view of ex what Scott is up to for the reasons you mentioned about him being methodical lover and all this. But another one, for instance, is like individuality. 
uh, SCOTUS has this, SCOTUS is really big. G- G- uh, Gerald Manley Hopkins brings this up in his poetry about dappled things and the kind of, that SCOTUS the man of the individual thing. He really wants, like things are very detailed from their individuals. He's very excited about individual. And I, I, and you could read, he's got this modern sense of individual kind of focus as opposed to, you know, a common good issue. But I think you can read it and ought to read it as the, under the lover rubric. This is how I think of it. Is and I think you make this this in the point in the book as well. Is Scotus believes in the individuals because God because love is about individual persons, individuals. You don't love really love math, not fully or Thomism. You love Saint Thomas, you know, or you love Jennifer, or you love what like individual people. So so maybe talk quickly about why Scotus cares so much about the individuals and why that the good parts of that maybe. Um, without worrying about the kind of individualism. Like Scotus, you could think it might be individualism or individualistic, but I think he's just a lover. And that requires, in a sense, this focus on the individual. Does that make any sense? It, it does. And I think it's beautifully said. And it, it, it makes me, I, th- I think it's worth saying here that your Scotus is sometimes um, associated with William of Ockham and nominalism uh which you know denies that say we all have a human nature that sets certain kinds of norms for uh flourishing or harm for what we for the kinds of things that we are and so so nominalism has all, has all sorts of problems it is uh part of the genealogy i think of uh, all the bad stuff that uh, scotus is sometimes accused of starting but but that sort of focus on the nominalists focus on individuals is very, very different from the sort of focus on individuals that SCOTUS has. Um, I mean, for one thing, at the level of like technical metaphysics, which we don't need to get into, SCOTUS focuses on his theory of individuality primarily because he is a realist about natures. So if, if, if we share natures in common, what is it that makes us distinct? And so it's in that context that he um, uh, develops his version of the doctrine of individuation, whereas the nominalist, of course, doesn't need to confront that problem. So, so both at the level of metaphysics, but then also, and I think more profoundly, what you're talking about, Father Bonaventure, that God's love extends all the way down to individuals. And so whatever the metaphysical arguments are, there is this sort of, uh, you know, ethos <laughs> Uh, with which Scotus does philosophy and theology that is centered on God's love. And again, as I said at the beginning, preeminently um, the love for Christ. Mm -hmm. So in one sense is um, a love for himself, um, but is also a love for that individualized human nature that from all eternity he saw and wanted to be united with. Um, Yeah. That's gorgeous. gorgeous. the The whole ordering of the cosmos it starts with an individual and then builds out individuals from there. Yeah. Now, when I say starts with an individual, I should say starts, starts with, with God himself, with the, with the Trinity loving, loving itself perfectly. And so doing anything it does for God's own sake. And so like the the next thought, so to speak Mm -hmm. is, well, I, we freely will to uh, love ourselves by uh, uniting ourselves with the nature, uniting the second person of the Trinity in Christ and creating a whole world for him to exist in. Who cares about sin? Yeah, exactly. Father Gregory, I, I know where you take it. You don't know. Um, (laughs) Well, you may. Uh, So philosophers will often use the word worry uh, to describe a variety of things, but kind of on a spectrum from on the one end, like prepossessing thought or preoccupation to the other end, naughty intellectual problem that has not yet been or may never be solved, which animates further inquiry. And I think that over the course of the conversation, we've been getting at a couple of uh, Scotus's worries. Um, again, not in a negative sense, just in the sense of the particular thoughts which animate his enterprise, his theological enterprise or his inquiry. And um, when it comes, the thing that you just mentioned, the incarnation, I guess I'm, I'm curious as to what, what his worry is, like why he wants to frame creation 
around Christ's human nature or to enshrine Christ's human nature at the heart of creation, because I suspect there's good reason for it. Um, but I don't know what it's responding to in the sense that I don't know what is, what is it that he really wants to, yeah, emphasize or push back against or otherwise incorporate into his theory. Like, how does this represent the answer to a question or is it a question that's being asked? I'm just not sure. So yeah. How did he come to this type of conclusion? What types of worries animated it? I suppose that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. So God for Scotus is the, the most methodical lover, the most orderly lover. So if, uh, so, so given God's decision to become incarnated in Christ, um, God does that for love, ultimately love for himself, but also we can say, God, uh, in doing that out of love, loves in the right order. And so, so the thought then would be, there would be something um, unseemly for God to, to do the most awesome thing possible in creation, uh, unite himself with a creature for the sake of, uh, pr primarily for the sake of fixing a problem with human beings. Hmm. Instead, instead, the thought is God, God does this most awesome thing in creation for his own sake. Um, and then uh, that firmly fixed as the main thing, then, you know, he could make all sorts of choices about what additional um, awesome things he'll do uh, with his incarnation or while incarnated. And, and so then solving the sin problem is uh, you know, logically posterior to the decision to, to, to become incarnate, but is still something that is eternally willed it's just um not logically the sin problem or fixing the sin problem is not logically prior to god's election to become incarnate the the um, main oh yeah. yeah so the problem now though is that that raises the new problem or at least you did is now i can't get my our god is an awesome god out of my head because <laughs> awesomeness was just now the property ascribed to why he's creating things which is just right. that is devastating that's that's a worse problem than sin as far as i can like the original the fall yeah getting that song stuck in your head exactly because yeah. it is worse it is it is it's basically basic evil yeah exactly yeah have you have you has you have you gone back and looked at the lyrics of the verses to that song um if i recall i believe one of them goes when he rolls up his sleeves, he's not just putting on the Ritz. Ritz. Uh, I think that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome God. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. And it, got... has, it has gestures with it. Evangelical days. Uh, I think Dr. Professor Ward, but yeah, I think you were an evangelical uh, convert as well as I was. So um, we've all made mistakes. Uh, and, uh, and that was an added piece to the God coming in the flesh in Christ was he also had to kind of deal with those mistakes. Um, he just wanted to come around and, and, and be awesome. And then they made this song and then the redemption needed. Okay. But um, so that's, that's let, me maybe, maybe. let me say something yeah, do it. that's really boring um, as a, as a additional thing to father Gregory's question, which is that great. Um, in Love the wake of things. condemnations of 1277 by, by Bishop Tompier, uh, Orthodox uh, minded theologians all sort of went into uh, like divine freedom preservation mode. Like they, 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 mm. they, Took it as a main goal of theology to emphasize God's freedom, to secure God's freedom, especially God's freedom from uh, the created order. That is, there's no facts about creatures mm -hmm. that determine God to do anything one way or another. So I think one one additional kind of worry or problem that we could see the uh, primacy of incarnation teaching um, sort of answering to is that. Uh, you know, if you, if you think back to Anselm's Curdeus Homo, and we have this kind of necessitarian language in, in Anselm that, you know, given the way in which humans messed things up so badly and dishonored God, God had to uh, fix the problem and, and could only do it in this way and, and so on. And so, so even though I think you could read Anselm carefully so that he's not really thinking that God is, is compelled uh, there is the necessitarian language. And so you can see Scotus as mm -hmm. reacting strongly against that in the wake of 1277 
by you know making this big stop like no it's not in response primarily in response to anything wrong with creation any duties mm -hmm. that god has to creatures uh it's just an expression ultimate primarily of god's self-love and anything else it does is posterior to that dear listeners under now you see the value of history in philosophy and theology that because 1277 good reason why uh it's not just like spinning out this theory but they actually respond to that yeah there we go excellent um we're running out of time but i cannot let you go without you giving at least a brief discussion comment on uh, a thing that most dominicans are kind of sore about uh the immaculate conception of course um because uh, dominicans all feel like scotus won but for like he was right for the wrong reasons whereas we were wrong for the right reasons like at least we didn't raise a creature to deification whereas scotus is kind of a count oftentimes at least the potted version is scotus is kind of like well i mean god could do it why not you know um and you think that's just <laughs> someone's maybe not being excited about that that exactly but in the book uh and this is the the if please if you have any questions about scotus on on this or anything or just about christianity in general or, or humanity or love <laughs> uh this is a book for you but um uh, what, Scotus, Scotus, the defense of the Mackin conception is for is for Christ. It's for Christ with Scotus, and it's not just God just wielding unbelievable power, um, right? This is an alchemist. So, what is what is Scotus? Is, what, what is why does Scotus believe in the Mackin conception? What is that extra piece you said, and why is it related to Christ? That's so beautiful. Yeah, good. It's, so it's not yeah, it's not merely that God could do it. Um, so the the thought is that Christ what christ does for us is uh is so let's call it powerful effective so to speak that it has void awesome it's yeah it has it has the christ's merits have the potential not just to uh save people who have already fallen but to prevent people from falling in the first place and so then there's this argument for for fittingness that it is fitting that god would uh save someone through christ's merits in this preemptive way um as a as a testament to the full range of christ's redemptive power the redemptive power of christ's merits so it's fitting that someone would do it and then once once you've sort of gone along with that then it's like fitting that that it would be the mother of god who receives that benefit both as a way of honoring her but also as a way of honoring himself. So there is this, um, you know, certainly a lot of Marian love in Scotus, uh, but also, but, it, but, but the Marian doctrine itself is also tied to Scotus's understanding of the, of the primacy of Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's, it, and I, I love it as a, it's, it's like the, the focus on individuality in this perfect human being that he's that he's made for Christ, this that Mary and Scotus is beautiful. And the Doctor of Immaculate Conception or Doctor of, of Mary or something at some point, uh, you know, Doctor Marie, whatever. Uh, we'll see. But um, there's more to be said, of course, Professor Ward. Um, but it's been delightful to to chat with you and and talk a little about this his book, um, which is available. Um, it came out actually on Blessed John, John Scotus's feast day, I believe. Um, you have another longer. You have a translation of his uh, his. On first principles coming out with a commentary um and that's if you once you once you read this book and you say wow i want to see how much of an achievement this book really was then you read that and you realize whoa subtle doctor is indeed subtle so um and people can find your your work online as well at different places so uh, thank you so much for for joining us and to explain to us about scotus and sharing with us a, a little about this too to thomas who not everyone always knows exactly who he is yeah thank you so much i, I really enjoyed it um, so that's uh, for us listeners, by the way, if you're looking for a book uh, or for anything in life, here it is. Okay, but back to this thing. Um, thanks again for all of our supporters. If you'd like to tithe to our tithe, if you'd like to give to our work, um, check us out on patreon.com forward slash Godsplaining. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. I think we do dancing now or something. I don't understand. Maybe the mustache. We'll move back and forth on this episode. Like, subscribe, leave a five-star review. Uh, visit godsplaining.org to shop our merchandise and to get updates uh, and information about upcoming coming God's playing events and retreats and all that sort of thing. But um, for us, that's it from here. Thanks for joining us. Please keep praying for us and we'll pray for you. And we'll catch you next time on God's Planning.